Yes, well, good afternoon, Sophie. Thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's David, as Sophie has said, and I'm the technical director here at Soapworks. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, at Soapworks, we um, manufacture soap bars. And one of the key things I want to discuss with you is palm oil, because palm oil is a key constituent in soap and has been for two centuries, uh, sorry, two centuries, two millennia, as indeed soap has been made for thousands of years. But without further ado, I'll, I'll crack on with this um, presentation I have because it's a very important and key question about the use of palm oil. There's been much in the way of the news uh, and much debate about whether or not it can ever be sustainable and, and what does it truly mean and what impact does it have. Um, and so I think hopefully through the presentation, you'll get an idea of what that means. So if we say what is palm oil first and foremostly, and Sophie, has, has that moved on okay? Yes, yeah, we're all going. We okay, can see. so what is palm oil? It's a type of edible vegetable oil uh, with many uses, just like olive oil, or rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, and coconut oil. These are all oils that come from what we deem to be vegetable sources. Um, they grow in bunches, are uh, known as fresh fruit bunches, uh, on the in the fronds of the of the oil palm tree. Um, oil palm trees were first uh, identified and found in in West Africa, but they've been cultivated all over the, the world in the tropical areas, as I'll mention to you. And what does a palm fruit look like? <clears throat> well, it's about the size of your thumb, and it's orange and red in colour, and it's kind of squashy in the outside, and it's got a little nut in the centre. Uh, the outside's called the mesocarp, and the, the flesh, if you like, of the fruit. And in the centre is a little nut, and it's a little, it looks like a miniature coconut. And in the middle, it's white, and again, you can get oil from that. So there's oil from the flesh and oil from the nut, palm oil and palm kernel oil, but they're, they're generically known as, as palm oil. <clears throat> so where's palm oil grown? As I say, it, it originally it comes from West Africa, but it only grows in the tropics, uh, and that is to say about 10 degrees in terms of, of latitude above and below the equator line. So you can see in that graphic there, there's a kind of pink line, that's, that's the equator, and those areas where you see those little trees is effectively where palm oil is grown. Most of the palm oil that we have um, that we have today um, and the, from the plantations and the small scale family farms, which are from smallholders, which I'll get to, most of it's in Indonesia uh, and Malaysia. That accounts for um, a significant 85% of the world's palm uh, plantations. That's where they are. But that's not to say that's where they are. Thailand also produces, but we also have West Africa and indeed in Central America, and specifically Colombia and that kind of area there, which is one of the areas that, that we get our palm from. So it's grown in those particular areas. And a lot of it is grown by smallholders. Smallholders are farmers who grow palm alongside other subsistence crops uh, where their family provides the, most of the labour and it's their primary source of income. So it's like a subsistence farming. So they're growing, basically, it's, it's growing this, the food that the, the plants and the, the vegetable crops are going to actually eat. And then they grow palm to generate a little bit of income from themselves to help them get the other bits and pieces that they would like um, to, to basically survive. So um, that's where palm is, is grown. But then, of course, the question is, well, there's lots of oils. We've talked about rapeseed and sunflower. Well, why palm oil? Why is this important? And actually, it just simple economics. All palm trees need much less land than other vegetable oil crops. And what do you mean by that? Well, other vegetable crops, such as soy, sunflower, rapes, as I've mentioned, use between four and ten times more land than oil palm trees to get the same amount of oil. That is to say, you get a much higher yield. Um, this is really important for economic reasons, but also it, for, for actual reasons of, of, of survival, as we'll get to. So you see in that graphic again, um, roughly per hectare per annum, you'll get about 3.8 tonnes of palm oil, whereas you'll get, you know, next one down is rapeseed at 0.8, a sunflower and soy. So, you know, you're talking upwards of five or six times as much palm oil per hectare than other crops. And that's important, um, as I say, for the economic side of things, but also for the ability to be able to produce. Um, so how does a palm get from the tree to you? Well, palm oil, as I say, is fresh fruit bunches. That's what they're known as. They're harvested, they're cut down regularly through the year and they're sent to a mill. A mill is a facility uh, usually next to the plantation uh, where the, the fresh fruit bunches are actually um, separated out into the actual fruits. And then the, the, the palm kernels removed 
and then they're, they're pressed to produce the oil. It is actually just like what they call cold pressing or whatever. So it's actually just pressed. You press the fruit and out comes the oil. Um, the, the palm oil supply chain is it's fairly extensive, however, and it involves many steps. So you can see in the graphic, you've got plantations and small holders, and that goes to the mill. So the, the pressure bunches go to the mill. They extract the oil, and then it's transported normally to a refinery or a blender. Now, we're talking about refinery. What they're doing is they're taking that crude oil and they're taking out, they make, they're making it, refining it into the, the, the oil that can be used and all the different things that palm oil is used for, which we'll come on to. So it then goes to the ingredient manufacturers and then it comes to product manufacturers like us who then convert it into, into products. Uh, and then it goes from us to the retailers, to our customers who are the supermarket chains and all the other others like that. But it's important to reflect that palm oil, uh, in many instances, doesn't remain as palm oil in the products that we buy. Much of the much of the palm oil that we have isn't actually palm oil. If you know, if I pick up a bar of soap like this, there's actually no palm oil in this, but it contains derivatives of palm oil, and that's what we mean when it says it contains palm oil. It might not actually contain palm oil, but derivatives of palm oil, and indeed that's really in part important part of what we talk about when we talk about the palm. Um, supply chain. What products contain palm oil? As I touched on there, you know, be surprisingly, palm oil is in is in almost everything actually. Uh, one of the things that makes palm quite different from other vegetable oils is it's extremely versatile and can be used in so many different ways. Uh, it, it's in foodstuffs, it's creamy, it's edible texture. So you know, oils are kind of butters and oils like that. A bit of margarines, of course, Unilever. That's, of course, where they started. Um, but also, you know, it can make fried products. So like crisps make nice and make nice and crunchy. It goes into cakes. There's all sorts of things. But of course, then you have the derivatives that go into cosmetics, such as soaps and shampoos. Um, and it can even make packaged products last longer because it's naturally preserving. Uh, and in the kind of uh, Asian and African markets, palm oil is regularly used just as a cooking oil. So when you see the word vegetable oil, it's commonly, not so much now in the UK, but certainly um, abroad, it's actually, when you see vegetable oil, it's palm oil. And again, as I say, it's highly versatile. So if you go to the supermarket and you look at all the, the processed foods that you see in the packages, all the biscuits and all the crisps and everything else, it's probably in about 50%, well, it's not probably, it is in about 50% of the packaged products at any supermarket you go into. It's in pretty much everything in some way or another. Not as palm oil, as I mentioned to you, but as the derivatives. And as I say, from it's ice cream, chocolate, pizza, biscuits, cereal, everything, you know, as well as, uh, who knew it was in toothpaste? But there you go, it is. Uh, and that's part and parcel of it. And it's, as I say, this it's such a versatile product. It can be, it's used and turned into so many different things and then we talk about it. I remember having a conversation with uh, a baker and we were talking about palm because they put vegetable oil in the product. And so that's direct, but they also have derivatives uh, in the filling that goes in and then further derivatives in the icing and further derivatives in the colouring for the icing for the cake. So you see how widespread it is and how why some of the challenges are in, uh, as you'll see, moving towards a more sustainable um, model uh, as such. So that's, what's in, that's what contains palm oil. So the big question is, palm oil bad for the environment? Well, I think that's fairly well answered. And the fact is that palm oil itself is not bad for the environment. It's what people do to get the palm oil, which is bad for, for the environment. The palm actually is a great product. It's just that what people do in it, to grow it, to cultivate it, that's wherein the problem lies. So as I say, almost all land is used for pharmaceutical once forest jungle in the UK and then anywhere else. As the world population grows, our need for more food has increased, which means land has been cleared for farming. Uh, animals, mostly cows, we talk about pigs and chicken. The biggest reason for deforestation, uh, or the biggest area for deforestation, I've just read from the COP26 um, uh, programme, the biggest area for deforestation is the Brazilian rainforest, the Amazonian rainforest. And the biggest reason for deforestation is the clearing of land, for predominantly for, for cattle, for beef, but also for putting down crops such as soy and everything else. Um, we talk about Indonesia, that's a bit further down the line, that's a bit fourth, but it's, it's, it's countries you wouldn't expect, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, that's another area, but so much of what's going on there is illegal, as I mentioned to you, you know, it's not the product, it's what people are doing. Having said that, um, you know, with the sugarcane and palm and everything else being planted, land is cleared, and this affects the natural environment, 
plants and animal species that live there unquestionably. In some of the areas where oil palm trees grow, they are unique animals such as the chimpanzees, elephants, gibbons, and of course, everybody knows in Indonesia specifically, in Sumatra and Borneo, orangutans. But there's also tigers as well as the tropical tree forest species as well. So if we look at the CITES list of what's endangered, it's not just necessarily animals, it's also plants and specifically trees. And, there, and there's very unusual ones like the Kempas, the Ram and the Mirante. Uh, and that's why it's so important to make sure that palm oil can be grown in a way that doesn't cause harm to the environment and natural habitat of these animals, as well as the people living there. Because again, it's about the people who live, the indigenous people and the people living there, they've got to be protected. Uh, and one way we can do this is we make sure that palm oil in our products is what we term sustainable palm oil. When we term what's the best alternative to palm oil, the answer is sustainable palm oil. And that's really key. And that is a message that's really important because it can be. And what do we mean by sustainable palm oil? Well, when a farmer grows oil palm trees in line with a number of very strict rules that protect the animals, the environment, and the people who live and work in the oil palm producing countries, then that oil comes from these farms is known as sustainable palm oil. And the rules are set by an organization known as the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil, or the RSPO. RSPO has been on the go, and we'll get to that in around since about 2004, and works with all different groups involved in the palm oil chain, including the farmers, those who transport it around the world, banks, believe it or not, food brands, as you know and love, supermarket chains, and as well as environmental and others, what we call NGOs, or you could say charities, but non-governmental organizations such as the WWF or Worldwide Fund for Nature. Um, and everybody in the RSPO works together, the, the whole team, to decide on the global rules for sustainable palm oil. And they must follow these rules very strictly. And to be clear, it's, and there is a, st a standard, and that standard is checked. And what I mean by that is we are, we, that so it works, we are audited, but so are the plantations audited, so are the mills audited, the refiners audited, transportation those who are converting it into those derivatives I mentioned to you, everybody is being checked annually, independently, to make sure we're following the rules, because that's one of the key areas. If, if it falls apart if someone's not following the rules, and that's why you have independent checking or auditing of, of this, of us, us, everybody in the what they call the supply chain, to make sure that when we hold something in our hand, we can say with absolute confidence, this comes, this is made from, sustainable palm oil. And that's the message and that's what's so important. If we talk about the RSPO, it's got more than 4,600 members worldwide who follow these strict criteria that include things like the no cleaning of new forests. So deforestation, has, is, it's not new, the, the ban on deforestation that came out of COP26, it's been on the go for a number of years now. Um, and, and also not just of new forests, but actually putting plantations in areas with a high number of animals or plant species known as high conservation areas. Protecting local communities to make sure the land is not taken from them to be turned into oil palm farms. It's so often the case that indigenous tribes or people living in these areas are driven out. And it's really important that there's rules to protect these people to make sure that does not happen. And in fact, that they're, they're encouraged to remain. Um, as I say, um, uh, no use of fire to clear land. Of course, it, it's huge. I mean, you know, even in Indonesia, huge, you know, uh, in terms of the fires that have been raised. Uh, Brazil was a huge thing, and I just saw something about the illegal logging. Ninety-six percent of logging in Brazil last year was, is considered to be uh, illegal, which is terrible. And a lot of that is clearing land for the timber, but also burning for laying down, um, just basically clearing the land. Um, protect the rights of people and children living with working in oil palm plantations. So important. Um, to reduce poverty by helping small farmers to be RSPO certified through training and funding. And that, that's key insofar as well, being working in that industry, there's an income, but you've got to make sure people aren't being exploited, to make sure they're being paid properly and fairly for the oil. As I mentioned to you about smallholders, so much palm oil comes from smallholders. You know, it's very important that these small farmers are protected as much as the major plantation growers. And as I say, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see some of the, the, uh, the logos of some of the organisations who are involved. Unilever, you'll see, is one of the major suppliers of cosmetics and toiletries on the planet, WWF, AAK, uh, plantation owners, Migros equally, and that's the Malaysian Palm Oil Association. So they're the work guys that really kind of kick-started it back in 2004. Of course, that's got, as I say, 4,000, over 4,600 members currently across the world. We talk about RSPO impact then. So what does it mean? Are the RSPO a little organisation? Is it a big organisation? Where are we? Where does it stand? 
Well, if we look at the global proportion of palm oil um, that's been actually made, 19% of it is certified. That is to say, of the palm oil that's available in the world, that's been grown every year, the RSPO has, <clears throat> the organisation, ha it touches about 19% of that, which is uh, it's significantly more than when I first looked into it, or uh, first started using the RSPO back in 2010 when it first became available on the market. Um, and that, you know, when it was about 8 or 9%, so it's grown significantly. As I say, there's 4,745 members now. Um, this is as of February last year. There's 156,927 individual smallholders with the RSPO membership. I mean, that's massive. That's, that's significant. Uh, and you can see the volume produced 15.4 million tonnes of RSPO certified sustainable PAMO available in the market for organisations to purchase and then convert and use in their products. Um, the RSP membership covers 96 countries across the world, which is, a, 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 you know, obviously the, 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 it's not just um, in the countries in the, in the tropical belt that grow this, but of course, countries such as ourselves in Western Europe, in the UK, uh, in North America, of course, who all want to be part of the RSPO membership and obtain that oil and use that oil. And as I say, uh, just under, well, just over 400,000 hectares of certified smallholder managed area. I mean, that's um, a mass. I was, look, I was looking to see what I could get in terms of what's the size of 419,000 hectares, uh, but there, nothing particularly meaningful that I could tell you, but you know, a very large part of the, the palm plantations. And it does account, as I say, for 90% of the global palm um, production. So I've said that, and the, the number one question, and I get asked, asked all the time, we don't want palm. We want, we, want to, we want to replace palm with other oils. We need to do that. So why is it not such a simple thing just to replace the palm oil with other oils? And I've mentioned already, fundamentally, um, you, you can use coconut oil. Of course you can. And we can certainly make a soap from a bar of coconut oil. Of course you can. But the tr problem is, as I said to you, it's all about this yield idea that you get, you know, four to ten times as much palm than you do others. So you're actually, you think about it, if you wanted to get the same amount of coconut oil to make your soap, I would be deforesting four to 10 times as much land to get the plantations from a coconut uh, oil to make the soap. So you can do it, but you're not really solving the problem. Um, the, the problem is not necessarily with the palm. I say it's a great product. It's what people are doing with it. And it's about controlling that, which is why it's not necessarily that. So, but we need more efficient crops, not only to obviously turn into bars of soap, but fundamentally, we've got to, you know, feed the po ever increasing populations in those countries, but of course across the globe. You know, without palm, palm. If you went to WHO, the World Health Organization, others, and said there's no palm oil, there would be a terrible crisis because it feeds so many people. And if you simply say, well, no more palm, then, then ultimately you've really got this issue that other crops simply can't fill that space that palm does, simply because of its yield characteristics. As I say. Palm's a great product. It's that's not the problem. It's what people do with it. So, secondly, as we, we, we talk about that and what palm does in its yield, but also we've got the fact that there's millions of farmers and their families work on oil palm. The smallholders, as I mentioned, those subsistence farmers, and it allows them to provide basic essentials such as food, clean water, housing, and a car, things we all kind of take for granted here in the UK or certainly in the Western world that are not necessarily as, you know, they can't just nip down to the Sainsbury's and get something for their tea. It's not as straightforward as that. And so it allows them to have a small income because they're part of a cooperatives. And cooperatives are where a number of farmers all get together in this RSB cooperative, and they work together to get fair price for oil. It goes to the mill, it's controlled properly. But also, I mean, it's, it's good for them so many other ways. You know, it's, I talk about clear, because the RSB rules are, are very strict about the use of pesticides and insecticides and that kind of thing. You know, you're not allowed to use paraquat, you're not allowed to use all these kind of terrible things which would damage the environment outside of actually planting palm. So in summary, for me, fundamentally the best solution to switch is to switch to sustainable palm oil rather than placing palm oil with other vegetable oils. Um, and as I mentioned, it's estimated that more than 3 million smallhold farmers make a living from palm oil globally. In Malaysia and Indonesia alone, smallholders account for about 40% of the total global palm oil production. And that's, that's normal. So you see, it's not huge corporations and massive, massive plantations that are ruining the, the, the forests and everything else. It's not the way of it at all. You've got a lot of subsistence farmers. That you've got, yes, you've got the plantations, but you've got a lot of subsistence farmers with their small plantations, and it's about bringing them into the fold 
saying to them there's a better way and that's what the RSPO has been doing and they go out and again individually check that these smallholder farmers are doing what they're supposed to be doing that they're following the rules of the RSPO providing the PAM in accordance with the rules in order for us to be able to then progress it into the products that we have um, and as I say that's key and this lady here been working in the Pamel plantations it's provided a stable source of income allowed to build a house and buy a car and I've I've actually visited the plantations and seen the staff not in Indonesia but in Colombia and you know um and you would think well you know is it real is it true what they do and I was and I first went out there in 2012 and I have to say I was absolutely blown away with, with, with the commitment that these people have they absolutely do they, they live it and breathe it every day because again whilst it's a set of rules and whilst you could argue it's about you know a, 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 you know trying to find a market it's not these people truly believe in protecting the environment trying to do something better you know and, and many of the smallholders are just looking for an outlet to do things well that they can sell their palm oil and and be accepted and and not necessarily be tainted with the brush that so many palm producers are with because it's a it's a it's not a true picture many years ago potentially absolutely i think there was concerns so much now is 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 better and as i say whilst it's not the entire palm um production globally it's about 19 percent it's certainly a, a way of moving forward so what can we do well the key thing is we're going to make sure we play our part uh, in using sustainable and deforestation free um, palm to protect wildlife and environment and in the oil producing countries of course which palm comes from and the best way to do this is to buy products and palm that support or use rspo sustainable palm oil and there's a few ways you can do this um but obviously and, I, and i've said i should parents help but ultimately you guys can i can can do this as you see it you can go into rspo website and, and check for members to see who they are you know in the uk it's safe to say all the retailers are so Sainsbury's, Tesco, Cooperative. These guys have all signed up. They're all RSPO members, and they demand that I, as a supplier, into them, supply only RSPO products, and that's key because it's about third-party manufacturer, and they are the retailers are the, are the ones with the power actually. Because if you want to sell your products in the retailers' stores, you have to follow their wants and wishes. And so, if I say that many of the uh, of the retailers in the UK um, are already doing this. There are other ways of doing this as well. Of course, you can go into the WWF website, have a look at that, um, as well as looking for this logo. Now you see that little green logo down there. It's kind of reversed out white. Sometimes you'll see it in black, you'll see it in different colors, but look for that little logo on products if you believe they contain palm oil. If you see the, you see the word, vegetable oil or anything on the ingredients list or anything you're buying if it's in cosmetics you'll see the word sodium palmate or but as i say there's so many different derivatives i could spend an hour just going through the list you know the key thing is really look out for the logo and the rsb trademark logo was launched in 2011 it's grown from 12 countries to 60 countries so it's a good number and as of as of last last year it was over 400 consumer products it's not a huge number but it is there and it's an increasing thing. So really it's, there's unlike organic or other or vegan symbols that you'll see in products, those people who use those logos have to pay a little bit of money to do so. This is free of charge. You know, this is the really RSPO want to promote the use of RSPO and they want to promote the fact to the consumer, there is another way. There is another way, which is there is a sustainable palm oil. Um, and for the reasons I've said. So that's really what we can do. That's about the RSPO. There is a sustainable palm. We're using it. Last year, 93, bearing in mind that we make other people's products for them, uh, we always, we remember the RSP, we promote palm, but not all our customers want to use it. And then we try and move them over to coconut or something. But the truth is 93% of the products we made last year were made with sustainable palm. And when I first started, um, when this was first made available to us, um, well, first certified palm was first made available in 2010, it was 50%. So you can see a lot of the retailers and a lot of our customers see the value in moving to sustainable palm and then insisting on it. And then of course, this is how this grows by people having aware that there is another way, that there is another solution, that message spreads. And then we end up with, as I say, doing the best we can to move towards as a fully sustainable palm model in the supply of what is a very important crop. So that's me, I'm gonna be quiet now.
and see if there's any 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 questions they want to ask. Well, thank you so much for that. That was extremely insightful, and it's really really interesting to hear, you know, someone who works firsthand with palm oil, and has done for a while, you know, to to really talk about the benefits of it because we don't often hear that at all. Um. So we have got plenty of questions. If you can, do you want to stop sharing your screen, David? Okay, I'll see if I can. And then I can get some questions up. We've got plenty coming in. Right, okay, so how do I stop sharing screen? Hang on, let me see if I can do it for you. Well, there we go, perfect. Okay, okay. So let's go right to the top because we've, <laughs> we've got quite a long list. So we'll go from the top. So we've got one question here, which is, even though I know you have answered some of these slightly during the PowerPoint, but um, so where from start to finish does Saltworks get their palm oil from? Okay, so we have two key sources. One is from the Solomon Islands, just off Indonesia, no orangutans, that's the first thing. And there's five uh, plantations in the Solomon Islands, which go to a central mill, uh, and that's uh, owned by New Britain Palm Oil, who's one of the most sustainable organisations you'll find in terms of provision of palm oil. That's the good news. And they're all RSPO. The second source we have is from a company called Devon, which is in Colombia. And again, um, that's where the, the plantations at Tekendama, it goes to the mill and then the refinery there, and they actually saponify it there. The, the oil we get from Solomon Isles is actually transferred to Liverpool and saponified in Leeds in the UK. So that's how that one works. So that's the two sources. And as you're absolutely right to ask, because so many people don't ask precisely where does your palm oil come from? Because, and that's part of the problem. And if people do ask yeah. the question, you do need to check because I'm audited, so I need to know. Lovely. Let's have a look. On so some questions coming in my chat. This keeps refreshing. Um, so we've got, this is a nice one. This is for you specifically. Is there any part of your job that you do not enjoy? No, that's a hard one. <laughs> I think, um, do you know, um, no, it's, it's a very different and varied job that I do because as technical director here, I'm responsible for what you might think, making bars of soap. But there's so much more to it than just that. Last week, I was with COP26. I was shaking the Colombian president's hand, which was nice. And But listening right. to him talk about the, the, the more, I mean, they've banned, they've banned since 2017 and deforestation in Colombia and the things that they do. So, no, I mean, as I think sometimes, you know, you can get, you know, I've got a very good team under me who look after the NPD lab and all the quality functions and everything else. And, and you know, when we talk about auditing, most people kind of want to run away and hide behind their desk when auditors arrive. But I'm very happy and proud to show people what we do here because it's part of that story. You know, it's about transparency. It's about showing people what you do. There isn't a secret. There's no black art to it. And, we, and if there's things we aren't doing quite right, we want auditors to find, great. Tell us how we can make it better. Yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. And on the back of that, what do you think made you want to kind of join this industry? So I guess if you said Palm became available in 2010, is that right? Yeah, no, I've been when here 20. First... Yeah, I've been in this business 20. I'm a chemist by yeah. profession. So I started to work for ICI and Welcome and, and moved through the kind of things like that. Um, but just, just in laboratories doing that kind of thing. Then I learned about the quality side of the work business uh, and quality assurance. And I moved here, uh, as I say, in 1994 for a few years and then suddenly I'm 28 years here so uh you know no that what made me you know it's I just give you a bit of background and very very quickly and because I don't I realize there's other questions the but so what's limited was started by the body shop it's actually started by the owner of the body shop who started it back in 1977 a lady oh, wow. called Dame Anita Roddick and she was one of the world's first, I would say, green campaigners. When there was no green agenda, when Billy didn't really care that much, she was the one that was banging the pots and making a noise and saying, you need to listen to this. And believe it or not, she'd come back from the Brazilian rainforest and started a campaign in 1987 called Stop the Burn about the deforestation of the Brazilian rainforest. And she was talking to a group of business leaders in Glasgow about the deforestation of the Amazonian rainforest and the suffering of the Kiapo Indians, the indigenous people who lived there. And there was an Easter house um, um, gentleman in the audience who put his hand up and said, excuse me, excuse me, do you not think before you ask us to help out people 3000 miles away, should we be doing something closer to home? So bizarrely, but true, this business started as a community project by 
part of the Body Shop International. And of course, everybody knows about their green credentials and their ethics. So when I arrived here, that was the first thing I noticed. It was all first name terms. There was no ties. It was all much more relaxed and a very a better way of doing it with the environment was an important aspect of everything we do, not just an add on. So that's part and parcel of why I came here, but also fundamentally, probably why I stayed. Lovely. So do you find it, you know, kind of rewarding in a way and enjoy getting the message across that palm oil, you know, is what when it's sustainable and used the right way it is good? Absolutely. I mean, exactly. You've no idea when you, when you hear like the owner of Iceland decrying palm oil and, and he's never been able to remove it because it's so indigenous throughout your product ranges. It's so difficult to do. But then we watched the, the world, the program with Sir David Attenborough. And, I'm, and I did watch this, the, the program when he was talking about the deforestation in, the, in, the, in Indonesia and the orangutans through my fingers like this. Not, and then he said at the very end, he said, but there's a better way. Palm can be bought and use sustainably. And I was like, thank you, Sir David, because <laughs> fundamentally, he mentioned, he says, you know, we're not going to get rid of palm, but we have to do it properly. I say, palm's a great product. It's what people do with it. It's the bad thing. And it's making sure that people follow these rules, that's it. So yeah, that's that's the joy I get from it, I suppose. Lovely. And we've got a question here, which is interesting. It says, are there products that are mostly made from palm oil that would surprise us? Well, I think most people don't realise that a bar of soap is probably about, the derivatives in it make up about 70% palm. It's what we call a palm-rich product. And so when we do have, we go to customers and they've got a cosmetics range, for instance, and they say, well, we want to use a sustainable palm. I say, well, do soap first. Because if you, if you do your soap, your little small range of four or five soap bars in your range of 100 products, I guarantee you it'll be 80% of your palm oil. And they go, well, then you come back to your board and you, for your CSR purposes and say, we've transferred 80% to RSBO Palm. Yeah, four products. But, you know, the, but at least the message there and then that, that, that wheel is starting to turn. So, yeah. Lovely. And do you think farmers can take more responsibility to be more sustainable? Yes, I think, you know, you've got to remember that RSPO is just an organisation. It doesn't run plantations, it doesn't do anything like that. Other people run them. It's just a set of rules and an organization which has oversight, an independent body, if you like. And yeah. so it's about those farmers wanting to adopt those rules. There are things in the way. There are, first of all, there's a, there's a lot of illeg you know, uh, Ill illegality. There's a lot of people who do things illegally. So they're clearing land for their own purposes, but they can't be part of the, the, the official, um, if you like, network. Even in Indonesia, and it, COPS, Indonesia signed the one of the 105 organizations that signed the agreement to end deforestation by 2030. And then two days later, we're hemming and hawing over it. Having said that, in 2019, the president put a moratorium, let's say a ban, on clearing new land. So it's all tied in with the governments as much as it is with the farmers, as much as the plantation owners, as much as it is with the smallholders. You tend to find the smallholders want to do the right thing because they want a market and they want, and the RSPO offers them a market to a particular mill, you know, and these kind of things. Yes, farmers can be done more, but it's about encouragement. It's about really, when I, when I went to, the, uh, to the, uh, the plantations and saw what they were doing, I mean, they're, they're, they're building clinics, they're building schools, you know, it's, it's doing that kind of thing. And people see the advantage in part of an organization which offers equal pay, you know, your rights and human rights are being preserved, all that, they kind of, gravitate towards that but it is you see the smaller farmers bearing in mind that's 40 percent of the world palm you know man, you know growing so it's a huge part of that but yes people can be doing more but it, you've got governments on one side of it if you, you take it the, the illegal activities out of it then you've got basically people wanting to do the right thing and most people want to do the right thing when you're finding you're in these areas they want a market it's not about trying to quietly do things illegally it's about trying to be up front and, and do it properly. So it's very much a joint effort from many parties, you think, the, but the yeah, blame kind of falls on one. Yeah, it's, it's not the plantation owners. It's, you've got, you've got uh, the plantation owners want to do things upright and, and normal because they'll only get, they, they pay tax and into the government and everything else. So the government wants to make sure they get a good yield, but they also want to make sure they're doing what they need to do in terms of the commitments they've made to the environment, you know, because in COP26 is signed that, you know, getting Indonesia to sign that is a big thing. Malaysia, 
But then you've got other countries like Bolivia in South America, which are sitting on the fence where there's massive amounts of deforestation. And so you've got that, and that's for lumber. That's actually just cutting down the, tum the timber for, for, for the wood, because we need wood. Um, truth is that it's a multi-component thing, but the set of rules is there and it's got a lot of recognition. And if we're simply saying we're not buying anything other than sustainable palm, the amount of sustainable palm will only continue to rise. Okay. What do you think is one of the most exciting things about your job? I know in the power part, obviously, you said you got to go and see the, the plantations. So yeah. is that, do you often get to do things like that? No, no, not, not, no, not really. Um, uh, but what I do, you know, what, what is different is I'm a, I'm a chemist, so I'm a bit of a scientist. Therefore, uh, you, you, chemists are what they call a bit blue green. You're not particularly um, creative. But in my role, looking after NPD lab, you know, it's for me, it's great. You know, we did a, a, a product um, and we talked about it the other day called, for, called Carbon Theory. And it's basically, it's a charcoal bar, facial cleansing bar. And a chap came to see us um, in 2018. He says, I've got an idea. We wouldn't normally give, you know, small entrepreneurs much space because, you know, they want 5,000 bars. Bearing in mind, we make 20 million a year. You know, they want five people, really? That's one hour on one machine to make 5,000 bars. And he said, no, no, it's this. And he came to see us. And we were so taken with them. And, you know, uh, and we sat at a meeting and he says, I want a carbon, you can have a carbon bar, but you can have charcoal. Charcoal, we can have, I've got sustainable charcoal from Dorset, which is really good. A really nice guy who makes it in Dorset. It's all properly done. He, you know, he's sustainably managing this wood, et cetera. And it's really different particle size. And he says, well, I want to put this, you can't put pharmaceuticals into cosmetics. It's not allowed, but you've got tea tree oil. Tea tree oil is a lovely product, you know. And we came up with this um, for, 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 for acne and bad skin. And I said, well, you've, and it took about 30 seconds to come up with that formulation. And we've just sold these millionth bar. Okay. So we just got my big thing to say. And, you know, for me, it's that, that idea of not happy accidents, but sometimes you just better create a bit of creativity on it. So I get to be a bit creative and come up with products. And this, this man's business has done, you know, massive global. He's on Good Morning America. The guy's done so well and I, I get a kick out of being part of other people's success like that because you know I like making nice products and I make some very nice products but really it's to get people to part with their cash to to put the ingredients in it to make it better and use sustainable palm and I might add carbon theory is 100% certified sustainable palm in their products so all good. Are all of the products used like when, when we make so sustainable? No. No. No, 90, 90%, 93% of our soap bar manufacturer last year. And that's because we inherit business a lot of the time. And what that means is um, somebody's making a product and they want to move to us to make it instead. So in the UK, rather than getting it made somewhere else, here's the formula. And we'll say, and we, people, we adopt people's formulas. And the first thing we do is say is, really? You want to think about moving to sustainable palm? And you say, no, no, our customer base is very happy with this and we'll think about it and we'll get to it. So we work on them over a period of time. The problem with palm oil as a, as a commodity, it's got a price, it does this. And sustainable palm oil is usually a little step above it. So it's a little bit more expensive. And so, you know, you're trying to convince people as we make other people's products for them to move to these products. So I wish it was 100%, I'm aiming for 100%, but as we make other people's products for them, sometimes you've got a little bit of negotiation to do to try and get them to come on board. But We've had more success this year and we'll have more success next year getting the last percentages over. I'm sure of it. Definitely. And have you, I mean, this might relate to that really, but have you ever, have you ever felt that something in your role is too challenging? <laughs> I think anybody in a senior role within an organisation will tell you, yes, absolutely. Sometimes it just gets too much. Um, no, I mean, I, I think the challenging aspects of it as, as we are our business development and sales manager, what she says to me, a director says to me all the time is an opportunity to shine, right? So uh, when things get a bit difficult, when things get awful, uh, should we say, and things absolutely, as we see up here, gang after glee, then truthfully, it's a really a case of, well, you know, that, that's an opportunity to shine. Uh, and we just came out of a meeting this morning before we, we, I joined this call today. And it's about all the new customers and all the new products and everything else. And we've got this customer who has changed things, changed things, and changed things again. And we kind of go, well, they want the delivery date there, but they've been changing things at every step of the way, which means that our 
opportunity to get this to them the way they want it is now like that. But as we say, an opportunity to shine. So, and that's I'm part of that whole team because um, I'm only just part of it. I'm not the whole thing here, so it works. And uh, yeah, so nothing gets too much sometimes. Sometimes if you're doing a 14 hour day, it gets a bit too much. Uh, if you're taking phone calls from Sainsbury's at 10 o'clock at night in a pub on Friday in Edinburgh, you're kind of going, really? But truthfully, it's that's uh, you know that's just part and parcel of doing what I do. And do you think you have a favourite soap that you have created or currently create? Absolutely. We we did a corporate soap for COP, which we just handed out to everybody. And you know, one of the things I'm proudest of here is that we do a lot of a week when you're making soap. You have at the end of every manufacturing run a little bit left over, and you put it back in the next time you make it. That particular formulation, that every formulation for every customer is unique. But at some point they say, we don't want that one anymore. And you're left with a quarter of a ton or whatever of 250 kilos of, of base. And you go, what do we do? We think it's a moral crime to put it in the ground. So we can put it all together and we, we, put it, we, we process it out as charity, what we call charity soap, what we call soap aid. And we gave this, and we did loads. And as you might imagine, through the pandemic, we gave loads away, loads away. But one, I remember one of the ones we did, a chart, and there's two ingredients which I put in for our corporate soap. And we had spare corporate soaps from last year, so we put it into the charity soap. And I remember you washing with it and going, this is a fantastic bar of soap. And, you know, it's every bit as good as, th as this one. And I was going, well, there you go. So, yes, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very, there are a few key ingredients you can put in, natural ingredients as well, which is really nice, which make a normal bar of soap extra special but then again i get excited about bars of soap because this is what i do for a living it's just a <laughs> bar of soap you know but there are better bars of soap so we say is tesco essentials the same as joe malone no 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 and it's not just about the fragrance yeah i could tell you that <laughs> <laughs> um so i think obviously we're getting on with time we've still got plenty of questions but i think to round up i think it'd be really nice if you could give some advice to all of the primary schools watching now and obviously this will be going up on youtube as well for people to watch um so as an engineer if you could give any advice to the kids what what would you say okay so um in terms of if if you know in terms of science i think science as a career and science moving forward is it's it's so important uh, it, because it's it's doing things so little of, i looked at who's making stuff in Scotland, of the working population in Scotland, only 4% actually make something in the manufacturing. And science has so much to offer, not just in the research and development, but actually in the making stuff, the doing the stuff that I do. And so I feel that it's a really rewarding side or, or sense of, of a career that you can look to have because you're making a difference. You're, you're making stuff. And whilst you can work in the service industries and it's great, I think ultimately for me, um, I think if you want to focus on science, you will have a, a, a career which will give you so much way of diversity. I mean, I, I do so many different things every day, and it's because of that area that I, I chose to practice. Why I'm a chemist, I don't do much chemistry anymore. I do so much more. And that, I think, is the key thing. It leads to different things moving on, and that's what's important. Well, thank you so, so much for your insight today. I can guarantee we've all learned a lot. I think we'll be going home and checking our soap bars to make sure that that RSPO logo is on there. Um, thank you, everybody, too, who, who has joined today and asked questions. We definitely did have our lunch and brain power because we've all done fab. So remember to join next week as well at the same time for our If You Were an Engineer, What Would You Do interviews. And until then, enjoy your week. And thank you so much to David. Big round of applause. You are absolutely amazing. And we're very, very grateful. Bye. You're very welcome. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, then. Bye.